Well, thank you, and thank you, um, and I pay my respects to Ghana. Um, I'm an Eastern Islander woman from the Northern Territory and am so very blessed to live, work and play on this country and uh, this is why there's so much power that we all get to walk upon and if we just look up a little bit further, there's that sleeping giant just over there. That is something that's so very special for us and we're here today and I think uh, I'm really honoured to be here today. Nara from the South Australian Film Corporation asked if Reconciliation SA would come on board and it is a busy week for us, but absolutely the importance of this conversation is something that I couldn't say no to. She didn't bribe me, just with common sense. Um, and I, and I, do, I do thank um, the South Australian Film Corporation for reaching out and, and asking us to come on board and really, I suppose, ask us to deep dive a little bit into this thing called reconciliation, um, what it means to be, you know, be, pra be brave and make change, but also, I suppose, delve into some of the practical parts of reconciliation and how what's become quite a big piece of, you know, big piece of learning for Australia, although we've known it for a while, um, especially with a new Prime Minister and a Premier, seeing how the Uluru Statement from the Heart connects in with this concept around reconciliation and who better than the amazing panel that we have with us today and I know I've been given some notes about, you know, a bit of a bio on the back of it, background of everybody, but I don't like to tell people's stories. If anyone knows me, I never do bio intros because I like others to tell their story. It's not my job to tell that. So can I just um, firstly say hello to you all? Uh, you know, we have Sally Scales, we have Alira McKenzie, and we also have Paul. <laughs> Paul, what's your last name? <laughs> <laughs> I knew this, I knew this. I'm a bit overwhelmed by the stardom sitting next to me. Um, can I just ask you to introduce yourself, why we're here today and why you're here today and uh, you know, well, a little about yourself and what brings you here today and why you said yes to sitting on this panel. And you know, Can we start with you, Sally, if that's okay, because you're sitting right next to me? Sure, sure, sure. Um, and also because I can't work out how to turn this microphone on and off, so I'm crackling all the time. Um, my name is Sally Scales. I'm a Pidendera woman from the APY lands. The APY lands are nestled in the far northwest corner of South Australia. I'm from a place called Biabjata. It's as far west as you could possibly go before you hit the WA border. Um, I can actually go to the three-way border in my home community within half an hour. So, um, and they said that there's less people being there than. Antarctica, but, you know, they don't count the blacks. Um, <laughs> sorry, just coming out firing. Um, uh, so I used to be the chair of APY Executive Council. Um, I was the second woman to ever be elected into that position, but I was also the youngest person ever to be in that position. And currently I am the partnership manager of the Uluru Statement from the Heart based out of UNSW uh, with Professor Davis and with Pat Anderson. And I've been part of the Uluru Statement team since the convention and the regional dialogues where I went to the Ross River Dialogue um, on constitutional reform and then invited myself to the Adelaide Dialogue <laughs> because while I'm Central Australian, I'm also South Australian. So, yeah. Thank you, Sally. And you're also a mum. I'm a mum. I look after my mum, but I've shared sharing custody of my mum by sending her up to Alice to, to my sister. Um, and I'm also an artist, so I can't really say how many years I've been painting, but I've been an intern of being an artist for 15 years. Thank you, Sally. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Um, impressive, and it, it is an honour to be able to work with you. Um, Alira McKenzie. Hi, everybody. Um, I, my name's Lyra McKenzie and I am a Bundjalung woman from northern New South Wales. So my family live in Lismore um, and I studied as a stage manager. So I'm used to being on the other side of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I um, currently work at the Art Gallery of South Australia in their public programs team. So I work on all events, uh, and I work on um, First Fridays mostly, programming First Fridays, which happens to coincide with the uh, Baker Boy concert <laughs> this Friday down in Pinky Flat. I will be at the art gallery until 9 o'clock for First Friday. <laughs> got to plug that. 
<laughs> China's doing lots and lots of uh, promotion for that. <laughs> um, and I think, and I am also just recently joined the Uluru Statement from the Heart as a youth dial dire de delegate for the youth delegate that just happened um in april just gone yep in sunny cairns in sunny cairns, in cairns. yeah and paul ryan thank you my pleasure um i don't know where to begin in fact uh, it's quite overwhelming to have been invited to join this panel um and certainly the welcome and the introduction uh was very emotional to sit here as a certainly a white male from a demographic that really, you know, now I can proudly say I think I've been enlightened through my own history, but um, a long way for me and others to go. Um, but so what's relevant to sort of introduce me is that I'm a filmmaker. I have a company here called 57 Films and part of that uh, company's journey has been very strongly aligned with First Nations projects and got some very strong friends and uh, partners in filmmaking, um, which I can talk to as we spend the next little while together. But also a father of three women, so that gives me a little bit more sort of cred to be in this wonderful panel. Um, and I'd like to say that I do try and lean into and understand all perspectives, but who can really do that in a genuine, authentic way every day. But reconciliation really is um, a moment to actually reflect and kind of draw up what's happened in your own biography, you know, what's happened in your life. And as I said al already, that being so privileged to have um, relationships that were real and authentic and not just a work a result of work doing this project or that project. There were authentic things. And I just want to say one thing of uh, one of the partnerships I have is with Uncle Moogie, who most of you would know, and we've got a JV together and all that sort of stuff. But what he said to me one day very early in our friendship, we were driving to uh, Raukan for a little shoot, and he said, you know, because I go, why are we doing this? And he said to me, um, look, Paul, the thing is, there are doors that I can open and you'll walk through them with me. And there are other doors that you'll open and I want to walk through those with you. So our partnership really was sort of grounded in that kind of friendship and sharing. And Uncle Moogie uh, is the most inspirational, one of the most inspirational people I've ever spent time with. So it's a privilege to really get that depth of truth from him. So truth telling is another thing that we'll talk about, I'm sure. But anyway, I could meander forever, but I didn't really know. And I wanted to consciously get rid of my notes, but <laughs> because they're annoying on my lap. But more importantly, I want to talk from here. And I'm again, so privileged to feel so privileged to be on this panel. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, it is truly I do a lot of panels and a lot of discussions um, as the CEO of Reconciliation SA and, and host a lot of events. But these are the conversations, I think, that um, these intimate conversations, I think, the ones that speak the loudest to people. And so with that, thank you. And I acknowledge each of you for your time and uh, your wisdom that you're going to share with us today. I'm just going to kind of go call out your name and ask you a question or, or, or I'll open it up. Um, Part of the conversation today, yes, we'll talk about Uluru in a second, but I'm really, really interested, Sally, when you think about the word reconciliation and the concepts that sit behind it, what comes to mind for you and, and what's your perspective on reconciliation in the past and today, really? Um, I would say it's... It's an interesting concept, reconciliation. It's, you know, coming together after a struggle or it's about reconciling after a dis disagreement, essentially. And, you know, it, you know, previously I thought it was quite tokenistic in the way that people go, well, let's just do an event for Reconciliation Week instead of deeping down into what their organisation can do, what their own self can do, what their um, company can do other than just the one week. 
And, you know, it's really changed with our partnership, learning more and more about the conversations that we have around race relations and then having the conversations about what our organisations and companies and individuals can do as well because it's all great to be on. You know, everyone's hyper on in this week. But I feel like we sort of lose that momentum, you know, and I think that's what we have to keep that pressure on and say, no, 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 this is an everyday situation. But I, I think it, the great thing about reconciliation, it makes people sit up and look in the rooms that they are in. You know, how many times have you walking into a room, are you seeing how many women there are in the room? Are you seeing how many people with a disability are in the room? Are you looking at how many Aboriginal or people of colour are in the room? So it's, it just makes people hyper aware of that. And I think they have a, you know, you know me, I love making people uncomfortable, but I get, I think people get into a space going, ooh, 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 that's right. We've, you know, we've only got one demographic in the room. And I think what we need people to do is then take that on and put those steps into place. But I think it's giving everyone a good little jolt about, oh, reassess where you're at. And I think they just need to continue doing that instead of just this one week. But it's a great, it's, it's become a great understanding the more I've worked with Reconciliation SA and with you because we constantly have conversations about this. But I think it's the great thing of people really reaching out and signing, wanting to know more and wanting to embrace it more. And I think that's the great thing. And, you know, reconciliation does give everyone the ability to go, oh, look, I really want to learn and I really want to go there. Help me. Yep. Absolutely. And then there's so many different forums in which we do that. And that's why I think it was really important for us to come on board with the South Australian Film Corporation. And why particularly, Paul, I wanted you to come on board on the panel because... As, uh, as a non-Aboriginal man um, working in this industry, owning a company and, you know, doing what you do, how do you um, interpret reconciliation and, and how do you embed it, I suppose, in the work that you do and what does it look like? Um, well, just reflecting on that, and obviously there's a lot of people in the audience that are very much um, involved in the South Australian film industry as well and uh, all play their part and I, I, I think I, the people that I do know personally, um, it isn't just a box being ticked. It really is authentic and it really is something that we bring to um, projects right from the beginning and, it, and in fact some writers that I work with a lot are often saying, well, let's not just do it because it's a box to be ticked. Let's do it because there's something to offer to be offered to the project, and all, and and it doesn't have to be a First Nations project. Any project, it's good to get uh, diversity of voice. So, um, and that's a genuine thing that sort of um, very much a sort of philosophy and a um, process, I suppose, in the film corp itself, in its in its own charter and guidelines, really sorts leans on that, that it should be, you know, a joint a joint collaboration and off you go. But um, there was, you know, the, there's so many ways that you could talk to that from a filmmaking point of view as well. And I know that the Uluru Statement of the Heart talks about the, his, you know, the under, I forget the exact line in there, but it's about having a, a truth, telling the truth about the history. And um, we all know that the more the 200 or so years that have happened there's a lot of stuff that we didn't know and and, and we we were didn't really want to know either the sort of um, books that you read that are I'm working with an author Peter Fitzsimons that you'd all know sometimes writes stuff that is controversial and that but he he says that in his research he finds it really difficult to find any perspective when you go back so I think as a filmmaking, from my own filmmaking lens, it's cr crucial that, um, you know, we do use this time to actually consciously, absolutely call out and ask for the involvement and the knowledge of a tr more truthful history. And there's one other little quick thing I'll say just while I can. <laughs> Um, and, no, and I was not looking forward to being on the stage for this 
conversational part, but the one important thing that I wanted to say is another part of what I've done over the years is uh, fee-for-service work. We do training and induction films and all that, not so much these days, but we used to. And I did uh, direct a, 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 a rap piece for PwC, a big, you know, the consultancy firm Australia-wide, and that was their rap. And in doing that, there was one thing that kept coming back to me, the conscious, I was really conscious of unconscious bias. So the one thing that sort of really started to work for me was that, yeah, that unconscious bias, that's such a really strong, important thing to sort of own. Am I unconsciously biased? You know, and I just put that to the audience that that to me is the, one of the critical things right now to really fl reflect on. Absolutely, and the concept of race relations and exploring um, our internal systems, and it's really interesting, we, we do run some training around racism and the history of racism and how that has um, shaped every every bit of our being in terms of our, our um, democracy, the way we learn, the way we talk. It is such an interesting journey, and the fact that that's reconciliation in play when you keep asking yourself Am I making these choices in words, in the way that I think, in the conversations I have, in, in the footsteps I leave, um, you know, decisions and comments and my own structures that are biasing one particular group over another? It's a very challenging thing but an important thing. Um, Alira, I'm going to ask you a question and, you know, I'm going to ask you this because... Paul and I can't claim this anymore, um, I don't think. And Sally likes to claim it, but I'm telling you, you can't. <laughs> Elder you, elder you. <laughs> Larry, you're technically classified in the youth space as a... Yes. And, and we're brought on board in the youth delicate, delicate, delegate world yeah. um, around Uluru's statement. I'm really interested from your perspective, from, from a youth you know, eyes yeah. um, and lens, your interpretation of reconciliation and, and how you've grown up and has it impacted the way that you see Australia and, and relationships between First Nations peoples and the wider community? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'll go back. I'll go back to the last part of the question. So when I was learning how to stage manage... Uh, I was the only Aboriginal person in the classroom and I was the only person, Aboriginal person, certainly in stage management in South Australia. So I feel reconciliation is a lot about having the, the hard questions that you, that unfortunately, you know, I'm 24, I've had to have these really difficult question, um, conversations with my managers and with people around me, people that I'm working with, because there is no one else to have those hard, difficult conversations with because there's no one else working in that space. So now I feel hopeful because of going up to Cairns, being a part of the Uru um uh, Uluru Statement from the Heart as a youth delegate because in the room there was uh, about 80 or there was, no, there's probably a little bit less, like 50 youth delegates all under 30 and most of them were either lawyers or they had spent a lot of time, you know, in the education system like at um, university, so they've had to spend, they've had to have all of those hard conversations probably as well because there is no one else to have those difficult conversations. Um, yeah. Does that, yep. is it? Is there more to that question? No, I think no. I've forgotten it. No, and that's an, no, that's <laughs> right. Well, that was my fault, not yours. <laughs> um, and I... It's interesting you talk about that too because yeah. one of the, um, you know, we talk about reconciliation around um, being brave and asking mm. questions yeah. and, um, you know, you know, seeking advice um, and being an ally. Yeah. But some of the consequences from your perspective, like I didn't grow up with this stuff. I didn't, yeah. no one asked me questions. No one had conversations with me when yeah. I was at school or uni or even in my early yeah. professional career. 
but our young people are clearly carrying a significant load in terms of trying to educate and navigate, yeah. you know, cultural competencies yes. in a way. Yeah? Yes. So, y- yes. So I'm up here as a 24-year-old. I don't necessarily feel like I ha- – and I don't have all of the knowledge. I th- And I definitely – like I own that. I'm not the – you know, I like to have conversations with people, constructive conversations with people about reconciliation and how I am not, I, I do not have the answers. You as a, I'm just, you as a, usually I'm working with um, the white Australia, you as a, a, a white person has to go out and seek those conversations seek out those conversations with the elders and the senior leadership that we have here in South Australia. Mm. Yeah. And harness the energy of the young, yeah? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, you talked a bit, thank you, Avira. I think that was a little bit of, for me, a little bit of a light bulb as well around um, some of the loading our young people do carry um, in that space. Um, good idea. Yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm thinking about more work projects here. Um, Sally, I just want to touch, you talked about Uluru's statement. And look, you know, we know that this is a phenomenal piece um, of work that was undertaken, and it's not just undertaken in 19, you know, well, we've got 2017, it's something that's been in place since 1788. Um, I'm really keen, not everybody might know, it's come to Australia's attention, I suppose, quite abruptly, because not everyone in Australia was aware of it when uh, um, it was first, um, you know, in 2017, and now we have a new Prime Minister that was within the first breath. Um, had put it into his, um, in, you know, his his acceptance speech. Can you can you please, for the benefit of all of us, give us a rundown around um, Uluru's statement, how it came to be, and the vision back in two seventeen for it. Um, so it so really the Uluru statement was started before that constitutional change, the dialogue around all of that happened during the Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd era, which I call aka the snake years, um, because they kept trying to do their own thing. (laughs) Sorry, that's just me having a joke at it all. Um, So that's when they, and that was with Rob Oakshaw having a conversation about what is, um, what is uh, the constitutional change, what is the ask from First Nations communities, and, you know, continuing that conversation. And, um, in 2016, 17, uh, the referendum council started to have regional dialogues, and um, you know they went around the country and they asked communities and they worked with local um, organisations on the ground to have um, delegates in the room. And it was a really deliberate way that they did it, where they wanted community representatives, people who weren't just associated to an organisation. And I'm really grateful they did it in that way because. For me, as a young female in the central desert, to go along to a consultation process was really quite rare. I mean, we quite often, when there is a consultation process, it is our elders and it is quite often men that are invited to a lot of that and also people based inside organisations. And from that, uh, we had the convention out at Uluru and... From that, the ask was really, you know, they went around the country and had really massive conversations about race relations, Section 23, you know, uh, also the recognize, sort of like the recognised movement, do we want just a little stamp on the Australian constitution that we're recognised and everyone th- threw that out and said, no, that's, that's meaningless. Um, and having proper massive conversations. And so from that... Uh, it came out the voice Makarata and the voice is really it enables us to be at the table um, of the constitution in that you know we've had advisory boards we've had ATSIC and all these sort of stuff but the voice allows us to be at the table in the decision making so that we can start to go well hang on that law and that policy might work there but it actually doesn't work over there you know, it's all all of the laws and policies that are passed in government are for us without us. You know, and it's it's I've noticed that recent in recent years, treaty has become the big tick box with politicians. Yes, we'll do a treaty, we'll do a treaty, we'll do a treaty. In South Australia, we've lived through one treaty process that failed within a change of government. So 
the constitutional lawyers, the treaty experts are saying, well, Australia, we need to stop comparing ourselves. Also, we always should stop comparing ourselves to other nations. But we compare ourselves so much to New Zealand and the Treaty of Waitangi and how we should have that. But that's not, you know, people over there don't necessarily think that's strong anymore. So, and also a proper treaty process in this country is going to take a long time, a long, long time. It's not, it, and we should be really, I get really scared when people say, oh, we can do a treaty within one term. That frightens me. Because you have to think about all the regional communities, you have to think about remote communities, all those tribes that you have to reconcile. Also, we have the stolen generation communities as well. There is a massive community there that we need to have a proper conversation with. And so to do a treaty process within one term of government where the first year you're setting up your government, the second year you're going out to have a consultation, the third year you're doing the report, and the fourth year you're in caretaker mode, like, really? So if we have a treaty process that goes separately, sits on the side and has done properly, that's what the voice, the umbrella for the voice will do. And the same time that treaty process is happening, let's sit there and have massive conversations and be a part of the conversation with the laws and the policies that affect our communities. So we're not waiting 10 years for a change. We can actually sit there and go, hang on. And I'll give you a prime example, and I use this all the time. <laughs> Uh, many moons ago, when I was 19, there was a Labor minister who I had gone to speak to her on behalf of my community and said, can you subsidise the cost of freight to the APY lands? And we wanted 500000 over five years to just to subsidise the cost of freight. You know, at this stage, it was like $14 for an iceberg lettuce, $40 for a pack of 20 nappies, no, 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 no. She decided that she wanted to do a market garden. $2 million for three market gardens that didn't exist more than three months or something. So that's the stuff that... And we got blamed for that. You know, Aboriginal people get, continuously get blamed for the failings of a law or policy that government do. But we've never been consulted. Or it's like, well, no, 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 I need to leave my own legacy. And so it's like... Well, no, let's actually work with the communities and say, what are you guys doing here that's working effectively and how can we continue that? So the constitutionally enshrined voice and a Macarada um, would... I'm just going to ask a really silly question. Will assist with that? Yeah. So the thing is also that's... And the process, that's why the, it's also saying voice Macarada and makarata is a Yulungu word for treaty and then there's that element of truth-telling. And truth-telling was put last because we need to be... So the voice needs enables us to be at the table, right? And the treaty process enables us to have those conversations about what our country can look like and how we want it to look like. But it also, it also levels up the imbalance of power between government and First Nations communities. And then that way we can have truth-telling without the Western lens on it all. Um, and that's what we really need. You know, there's too many truths out there that is not through our communities, not through our own lens. But that's what the voice would enable is allowing us to have that conversation, allowing us to be a part of it. And it's also not... It has to be done through a referendum because we need it constitutionally enshrined because we've already lived through a legislative process with ATSIC where it was going well and then a stroke of the pen, the government got rid of it. And we can't do that. We can't expect pe Aboriginal people to keep being told, no, 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 we're going to make you try this before we, we allow we fully lean in and buy it. Because we just know that there's those conservatives who are going to say, oh, no, see, look, look, it's failing, so aren't we glad we didn't go through a... Cons we didn't go through a referendum. And if it does work, they'll go, well... Why do we need to go through a referendum? A constitutional body is all good. Absolutely. And you talk about lenses and how our world is constantly interpreted by a dominant culture lens. And I don't mean to kind of use the lens <laughs> in a film context, but I am going to ask you, Paul. Well, I do, actually. Um, Paul, I, I did want to throw to you on this one because, um, you know, this industry... Um, talks about doing truth-telling um, and, and constantly on that journey. 
How do you think it's fared in terms of its lens on First Nations interests and how are we tracking as we're going forward in that space? There's probably a number of ways to respond to that question and it's a big question really. I mean, there's some good examples of the right voice um, and there's certainly some great authentic filmmakers that absolutely work with and for the right message, uh, Rolf to here and so on, those sort of people are pretty well known and they really do care genuinely and there, there are other examples. But can I just go back to what Sally was saying about that do-gooder thing? You know, like the, the, there's, you know, agencies and individuals that throughout this last period of history have, you know, I've seen it. I've fortunately been to APY lands and Arnhem land and, you know, various other... Raukin and so on, and and with a lens for a film, pretty much being there to you know share someone's story or a, or a, try and promote a particular truth um, for for Aboriginal um, partners in that um, had a really good one for about five years where we were working with Arabana uh, Kukata Kiani up and around Olympic Dam when they were going to basically dig it all up and collect, there was about 10,000 artefacts and so on, and walking the land with uh, Glenn and Harry and so on, that was fantastic because they were telling us stuff as we went, you know, it was, a, again, another eye-opening thing. But then on top of this process, though, were these white archaeologists that were telling them what it all meant. And I'm going, for, for you know, for, uh, these guys know they, you know, it's their land, it's their stuff, um, and they valued it. But anyway, so that's one real first-hand example. I felt really uncomfortable being the white guy out there, uh, sort of the one with the authority from the filmmaking point of view. Yes, fair enough. Or, but there were these other people all around it that were the process that was being done. They were in charge of First Nations, a uh, First Nations agenda. I've seen the sorts of things in the APY lands, like old, you know, orange orchards that are just gnarly old trees because they were put in the wrong spot. But it's their fault, definitely their fault. They should have looked after them better, et cetera. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I really wanted to talk to Sally's point. That's right. You see, you can go to catch up later yeah. and have a bit more. Yeah. No, I, I think the point in the conversation is if that, you know, nothing about us without us, and also the conversation that a dear friend of all of us, um, you know, talks about is that if we're not at the table, then um, guess what? We're on the menu in some of these conversations. And the important, the important part of the Uluru statement is to bring First Nations voice to front and centre and that perspective and lens. Um, Alira, you, you're new to the Uluru um, campaign movement nationally. What, why? What, what was it about it that spoke to you? Yeah. And what what are your hopes for Uluru and reconciliation in that in that space? Yeah, so I am new to it, but my auntie Tina Williams um, ha, is a signatory signatory on the Uluru statement from the heart. She was the elected councillor for the new the, the New South Wales Land Council. Um, so that's how I've kind of got into the Uluru statement from the heart. What's the second part of the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got into it that way, but yes. what is it, you know, what is it that your involvement you're hoping to do with that? You're, you're in now. Yeah. What do you want to do from here? Well, I guess I, you know, ultimately want to, ultimately I want to stop having hard conversations and I feel like th doing this, being part of the Uluru Statement from the Heart is a way of doing this. It's also I've come into it in a really interesting time because, you know, I was there in April that, that we hadn't gone to an election. The election had not been called. So now it's kind of taken off in a whole nother way because of the new uh, Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and how supportive he is of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So... I guess I am now I feel like I am an advocate for the statement from the heart 
because of the political sphere that we're currently in at the moment. Does that answer the question? You can answer it. Yeah. Anyway. Like, Absolutely. <laughs> no, and this yeah. is what drives you in this space yes. and everyone's going to have a different reason for driving themselves yes. and working in this space. And I think, um, you know, I'm just going to open up to open slather questions mm. now, to be honest, because I think one of the things I'm really keen about yeah. is, um, you know, we have these things in the reconciliation world called reconciliation action plans, which, you know, from a very, you know, from my perspective is just a tool. That's what it is. It's a document. It's a tool. It's a process. It's a framework for organisations to kind of, you know, figure out what how they can be brave and some actions they can take to, to, to make change. How do you think that those... Um, tools that organisations have, and this is open probably to all three as we go through, how can those tools be um, activated to support the Uluru Statement from the heart and that, you know, First Nations voice agreement, you know, treaty agreement negotiations and uh, truth-telling? How, how do you think they can be used? Who wants to go first? Um, I'll go first. <laughs> you know me, Shona. Mm -hmm. um, the, I suppose the biggest thing in that is I would... I would say, yes, we have Albanese who's, and Labor who's coming on board and who said, yes, you know, they, they want to embed the Uluru Statement in full in this term. But we have to say we have to, as Australians, keep the pressure on because I think people have forgotten or don't realise that the Uluru Statement was gifted to all of you. It was mm. gifted to all Australians. Yes. It was purposely wasn't gifted to Parliament. It wasn't gifted to government. It was gifted to all Australians. And that message is for all of you. And it's like, how are you going to use it for yourself yes. in the organisations you are, in the circles that you are, to have those conversations? And, you know, there's been a... I would also like to say it's actually okay... There's this weird myth out there that all black people have to agree. It's actually okay that we disagree. There is community members that won't agree with the Uluru Statement and that is fine. There is some community members that don't want the voice, they want treaty first. That is all okay. I think there's a weird myth out there that all minority groups have to be in full agreement. And I, it just boggles my mind because non-Indigenous people you guys can all have varying opinions, you know. We saw this in the election. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so I think it's that, I just want to debust that myth, but I think it's about using your own collective voices, saying how can we do this? Having conversations about the Uluru Statement in your workplace, having the conversations about what are the voices in your rooms, you know. I always say one is a token, two is a change. So what are you seeing in the spaces that you're in? Like, yes, we have three phenomenal black women up here, but how often do you see that? So it's one is a token, two is a change. So it's going and having those conversations and going, well, how do we embed this Uluru voice? How do we embed the treaty making? How do we make it that it's, how do we have a truth telling where we're not just going and doing a film, like in the film world, we're not just going to the, uh, a site to do filming and having a welcome. Are we having an Indigenous voice consultation process in the room of the writers to make sure that if there is a dialogue that is in language or if there is a dialogue by First Nations communities members in the film or in the doco that aren't a bit like, oh, what? You know, how are we making sure that they're a part of that conversation? So it's all of those things of this is what the Uluru Statement is. and. Your civic responsibility started on Saturday. What's last Saturday? Yep. Mm -hmm. That it started on last Saturday. We think that that's the end of our civic responsibilities. It's not. How often have you guys gone to a, a march, a protest, and then follow that up with a letter to your MP? How many people have done that where they've then gone, well, I want to have a conversation and meeting with that MP? or said, you know, this is what our organisations, you know, and how often are we following up those um, elected members now and saying, we, well, you know, you promised this in the election, what are you going to do about it? So it's all about that. We have to keep the pressure on. The refer we now the ask is the referendum. Mm. So we have to keep the pressure on. But it's really about collectively remember that it was gifted to you, you know, and then you're going to find mob that disagree and that's absolutely fine. 
And it's just about how do you use this and how are you going to take the invitation that was given to all of you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sally does this for a living. <laughs> and that's I, why <laughs> Sally's here, but you're also here because um, you're awesome, young and deadly and have a voice. Yes. Um, thank you. I, I think, you know, the Uluru... Having constitutional recognition in the Australian Constitution, it it gives us, you know, um, something tangible to see that Australia is with Aboriginal people. This Reconciliation Week, I've had a couple of people reach out to me for the first time in a, ever. No one has ever reached out to me about like what can I do as a as a as a person that doesn't really know many Aboriginal people and you happen to be the only <laughs> Aboriginal person that I know. How can I, you know, look into reconciliation? And I usually just send them the the uh, a link to the Uluru Statement from the Heart and then the National Reconciliation uh, not Week my, not my website. website. Not I my, know it's not, not your website. website. I know Clearly. it's not your website. No. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's very interesting socially and politically at the moment seeing people that I know have been racist in the past mm -hmm. suddenly be like, oh, this is amazing. We, uh, this is, I love Aboriginal people and like actually take, you know, but it's actually, it's, you know, that's not great. Obviously the racism is not great, <laughs> but it's interesting and it's amazing that there is a social change. You're saying there's a lot of social change that's happening right now and I feel for the elders and for the senior leaders in Australia, they have had you know, my dad was one in 1967. I am now 24. It is, it is, my nan had four kids before she was, she had the right to vote. Mm. And now I think it's actually hitting the rest of Australia that this is, that, oh, we can actually make real change for Aboriginal people to give Aboriginal people at least a voice to Parliament and let them run the show. Mm. Let, let them run, you know, their however, you know, structures that they want to put in place to make their society better. Yep. Yeah. Paul? Well, again, a very... Um, that was wonderfully put. Um, I think the thing I would kind of want to add to it somehow, and it's probably a clumsy way of putting it, there are many agendas uh, throughout the world and society in general. Um, and, you know, when you listen to the platforms that um, parties put forward at election time, which is recent here in SA and obviously federally, there's tonnes of stuff. But unless you get the foundations right, well, it, it never feels quite right. And I think, you know, having the... Malinowskis as well as Albanese both coming out with the first thing, it gives everyone a bit of confidence and, well, it certainly made me feel a bit relieved. There was sort of this embarrassment that you, you, you brush away all the time. It's, we all, oh, yeah, well, that'll, you know, it's not right, but I don't know, what can we do? This is coming from the top. This is what we now do. We have to do this. We've got to get this right. This is now, if not now, when? You know, that kind of thing. And I think that's really important. And I keep thinking of another conversation with Uncle Moggy. I hope he doesn't mind me paraphrasing his stuff all the time today. I'm sorry if it seems appropriation. But um, he says, because he goes, oh, look, a lot of people that, because, um, you know, he, um, obviously his family and his own nun and Jerry and, Ghana friends uh, say, well, why, how can you're always so sharing with these white fellas and you're hanging around with that filmmaker guy and all that? And he goes, Paul, I, I look at him and I say, those white fellas aren't going anywhere. We've got to get, we've got to get that right. And it's up to us, not up to him and not up to you. It's up to us to make, we've got to atone for it. We've got to reconcile. And the governments are saying that. So hopefully, 
you know, we make them do it, as you were saying. So. And I think that's the thing, though, Paul, is that, yes, Albanese and Malinaskis have come out in support of it, but, you know, and it is, but we have to, we can't forget our own people power. You know, we have to keep pushing them. We have to keep that momentum going because government are really good about doing the first thing. They aren't good about doing the second thing. And they're great at promising stuff but never doing anything. So we, uh, uh, my call to all of you is just to keep the pressure on. Keep the pressure on. Keep writing. Keep talking to your MPs and keep that Uluru Statement live because it's not, we, as Aboriginal people, we always see them crumble at the end, you know, because another myth out there is that Aboriginal affairs always has to be done in bipartisan and it's the only thing that's ever done in bipartisan. Uh, which is mind-boggling to me. So we have to keep the pressure on and say, no, 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 keep going, keep going. It's, you know, it's we have to keep that pressure on because we saw Kevin Rudd said sorry, but nothing else happened with our stolen generation. Yeah. And that's the saddest thing. That's the worst thing that happened. You know, it would, took too long and it's taking still too long. So I think we have to keep the pressure on. We have to re recognise our own power and our own internal decision-making to say, you know what, enough is enough, let's go, let's change the, what our nation looks like. And that, that means keeping that pressure on. Mira, you look, look like you want to eat. <laughs> I, <laughs> 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 I was actually uh, uh, off topic thinking about um, how we can use raps. Yes. 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 Reconciliation action plans. Yes. Um, and um, and I was just thinking, I was a you know I was a trainee, and I was the only Aboriginal person in that trainee, and I I was just actually <laughs> thinking about how we can get more Aboriginal people in traineeships, and in the workplace is th through those um, uh, rap plans, but also you know, thinking about structures in a different way for supporting those mm. those Aboriginal followers and making sure that they feel supported and that they have connecting them with the wider mob of Austra um, South Australia and Australia. Yeah. yeah. Completely. And the raps do pick up that. They have, um, well, it's how well you do them. It's, so raps, yes. you know, <laughs> let's put, you know, raps are plans um, and that's the part that we need to translate is best intentions and those deliverables into doables. Um, and so that's, I suppose, um, up to the organisation and the individuals to do that. And there are procurement goals, mm. there are employment targets, there are um, basic respect functions that sit within RAPS. So if your organisation has one, do have a look at it and then feel okay, I think, in this space to, to ask the questions around whether First Nations perspectives were accessed in developing these reconciliation action plans. I think it's a fair from the conversation today is to ask people to take a reflection upon what their organisation's role has been regarding First Nation inclusivity in the past. I think it's fair to ask those questions and then keep tracking the progress on that. I think they're the conversations that have come out today that I think are really important when it comes to reconciliation action plans is um, you know, who's, who's developing them, how are they being inclusive and how are they being done at the end of the day. And I did want to pick up on your point, Sally, around um, politicians and governments, you know, react, well, politicians particularly react to, um, you know, the drive from the public, their constituents. Mm. Um, and I think that's, you know, when we talk about civic action is, is as soon as constituents don't take an interest in a topic, either do the politicians. Mm. And I remember I was very honoured to be invited to Cairns to be a part of the senior leader dialogue. Um, and I have to say we were the only reconciliation body that was invited. So, you know, go SA. Um, and, I, and it was a great honour to do that. But there was a person in, and I have to, you know, I can't own this conversation. I don't know who it was. I didn't know his name. But he stood up and he said that this process, it's not about blue politics. It's not about red politics, it's not about green politics, it's about black politics. Um, and let's not forget that because none of the other colours, and let's be fair, we're going to add teal in there too, <laughs> none of the other, none of the other colours have ever managed to navigate 
um, First Nations interests in a successful way in the past. So obviously that process hasn't worked before. So now is a time where we put First Nations matters of interest on the national stage for discussion. And I think that's what we're doing now. The time is right. History is calling, which yeah. is the Uluru <laughs> statement, new campaign that is coming. Um, and that's a really exciting one. Um, and I'm really excited to see where the next 12 months, because let's be honest, if a referendum's going to happen, it needs to happen within the 12, tw next 12 months, because uh, you know, political parties don't stay in favour for longer than 12 <laughs> months. So let's get this thing happening. But I, we have kind of used up our time here today yeah. and I'm really appreciative of you all coming and, and sitting and being with me. I understand there's some questions, Q&As that are supposed to happen um, and I'm not sure how that's going to run. But is there any questions from the audience while we've got our panellists here? Um, any questions you want clarifying or anything else you want Sally to controversially <laughs> answer? Um. <laughs> I would say before the questions, check out our website, check out the Uluru Statement. Mm. One of the coolest things we've done is actually translate the Uluru Statement into multiple um, First Nations languages but world languages as well. So it's in an audio and then the PDF as well. Um, there's also someone translated it into Latin, so, you know, if you, you know. <laughs> if you felt the name. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't read that dead language. <laughs> so any questions? Just, I suppose, shout them out from the crowd today. Um, so my question is, how can we at the South Australian Film Corporation be as approachable and accessible and um, effective at uh, enabling First Nations storytelling? You oh, me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my biggest thing is have a wide network. Um, we, we are on beautiful Ghana country, but there is an incredible vast... South Australia has a, an incredible vast group of First Nations communities and it's about tapping into all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but also do your own research. Um, I'm one of those ones. I won't be your uh, library. There is already too. There is a lot of library out there. Um, so you have to do your own research. You have to figure out who, what information is already out there. Um, you know, we have a vast, rich history in South Australia. You know, there is a lot of trauma-based comments, there's also, but there's some incredible First Nations leadership that's happened and how are we incorporating their stories into the film world? You know, we can talk about Maralinga, but are we talking about Lowija? Are we talking about Yami Lester? Are we talking about, you know, and I'm just doing young Kunjana mob at the moment, yeah. but, you know, it's how are we incorporating all these different stories? And, you know, we talk about the Murray Island Basin or we talk about the Riverlands. Like, South Australia is vast, it's rich, it's you know, and it's really about, okay, do your research and figure out what stories are out there and be also be okay with people telling you, I don't want my story being told. Mm. You know, I don't want that conversation. I will, or I want this conversation, but I only want it for the kids in our community. You know, how are you going to develop? Like I sit on the Australian Children's Television Foundation board. How much of our content are we doing for young kids anymore? Mm. Um, and then there's also, you know, fostering and f helping to facilitate all those um, young Aboriginal filmmakers. There are a lot of them out there. Like I think they've just released the Nunga screening of 2022. Is that with SA Film Corp? We're a sponsor. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure, but, yeah, there's beautiful things like that happening and that's kind of in the... In the a uh, South Australian community or Ghana mob community, yeah. But all of the all of the film stuff yeah. around it. Where are the First Nations writers? Yeah. You know, the screen producers. You know, photography. All of that sort of stuff. All of those elements, because there would be people that want to be in front of the film, mm. people that want to be right behind. Yeah, that's true. Um, I took my nephew and niece to watch a film, a kids' TV show. Both of them were like, "Oh my god, being an actor is boring." I was like, "Yep." So, you know, but they like the director's seat. So it's all of those things about going, well, how do we incorporate that all? But I would also say, what are we doing for our young people? What content are we making for young people nowadays? Because there is nothing on commercial TV. That was, sorry, that was great. Any more questions? 
in the audience? We will be sticking around for lunch if you want to. We've got another question. Hello, my name's Jeanette Miller. I'm Ghana, Narunga, Arabana. Some of the panel members may know me, Sally, Shona. My question is, as an Aboriginal person, will there still be an advisory group or a voice that is restricted and still going to be under a Liberal or Labor government? Will our voice still be coming through government, whereas I see treaty may not be the best thing because I don't think you can make, nations can make treaties with corporations and government is a corporation. I don't feel that this is the best way because I feel we need that black voice. We have a yellow, a green voice, a red voice, a blue voice. I feel being in my 50s and being around the table with a lot of elders, sitting at the Aboriginal, South Australian Aboriginal women's gatherings, bringing 350 Aboriginal women together, putting recommendations together, a lot of those still haven't been implemented. And this is probably the work that I feel that I need to do around those changes in policy and legislation like you talk about, but we're still 20 years into reconciliation, I still not see any changes embedded, and that's the word, embedded, in organisations, in corporations, in government, within these legislations and policies and acts that have to include us. Like you say, Sally, they have never included us from day dot. And I think, to be honest, we need to look at the word reconciliation. If we look at it and the meaning of it in the Oxford Dictionary, it's probably not the right word. So is it, my, back to my question, is it still <laughs> going to be an advisory voice? Because I would rather our own political party have all these mob here vote for us, have our own platforms, our own statement, and what we really want instead of having someone else still be our voice and us still be the menu. Great question there, Dan. And also, I think we should do that anyway as well. I think, I, I think if we can have a black party and then also have the voice inside, that's great. Um, the way that the functions would sit, and this is the conversations we've been having on the national sense, is that it will be part of the the everyday functions of parliament. So it sort of goes into the structural element of parliament in the government. And the, what we're wanting to do is really say, well, allow us to be at that conversation, allow us to be there so that all of these recommendations, you like all of those recommendations, that's not the only ones, you know, the deaths in custody, the bringing them home report, all of these ones where our community members, this is the truth telling bit, right? How many times have our mob been told to give a report, be a part of consultation process, do all of that every year? And those reports, and Sammy Wilson, who's the traditional owner of Uluru said this, he said, you know, we give all this information like it's like those big, <laughs> I loved it when he said this, it's like those big phone books, you know, the big yellow ones. Report after report, report. Now, we give all of that, but when it hits Canberra or when it hits Adelaide, it's a one piece of paper. So how are we going to change that? And that and that's the thing that we're trying to today is we actually need to be a part of that conversation. We need to sit there and go, hang on a minute. Instead of reinventing this reel, instead of you coming in as a hotshot young politician and saying, well, oh, this is my legacy building brand that I want to do here, go, well, hang on, have you actually read those recommendations in those, in those reports? Have you actually read what community members have said? Have you actually seen that? And let's do that instead of what you're wanting to do because that's the voices. It's those local community voices and that's what we are wanting to see and that's... 
And I don't know if I've answered your question correctly because it, we're still having – people want to have so much meat on the bones around what the voice would look like. We know that th that's not needed because in a constitutional sense, you don't have to have all the meat on the bones um, because you, you then diminish what the ca capacity of it can be. It's sort of like the high courts. We just say that we're going to have a high court. Legislation changes how that looks. And so that's what we're sort of saying is like, let us have that body and let's that include and have it where it could be, it, we, I would love it to be 200 Aboriginal voices from around this country, men and women, you know, who are on that conversation because we have to make sure women are part of this voice. And we've always said that it has to be, it has to be um, both genders on that space. So, I mean, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you after, Janet, and we can go through it and, yeah. Yeah, but I think like um, the lady down the front here said and you touched on it as well is also the inclusion um, and having that inclusion of our mob in the workspace. And I was a, one of them little trainees in the space that I had to inform the whole organisation yeah. about Aboriginal culture, you know, so... That's 30 years ago, you know, and we're still yeah. having our mob subject to that staff in the workspace. And I hope you're looking after your mental health, love, because I tell you what, <laughs> that can be draining. Absolutely. Because if you go back, it's not in the education system. And this is the stuff where it needs to be embedded mm -hmm. yep. in our education system. So we need to look at what you say, champions, who is going to be our change champions? Because I've heard that word at that women's gathering for many years. Yeah. We need you, mob, sitting in this room because we are only 2%. So like Sally and the, book and the members say, include us, embed us, and things will start changing and I can maybe die happy and <laughs> I know my grandson can have a good life. Beautiful, thank you. We've run out of time, so <laughs> thank you to everyone for your participation and engagement and thank you again to our panellists and for Shona for facilitating the discussion. Thank you for attending everyone today.